So today is solving systems of nonlinear equations. This is going to help you when we get to finding the area between two curves because you need to figure out where the two curves intersect in order to find the range over which you take the integral. So we'll start. There's two ways of doing nonlinear systems, just like there are two ways of doing linear systems. You can do them with substitution or with elimination. So we'll do a few with substitution, then we'll do a few with elimination. First thing you do is sketch it if you can. So if we had something like x squared plus y equals 10 and x minus 2y equals negative 10, I would expect that you could graph those things. Now they don't have to be perfect graphs. I would rewrite this as y equals 10 minus x squared. And then you know that that's just your generic parabola flipped upside down and shifted up 10 units. And then rewrite this, negative 2y equals negative x minus 10. So y equals x over 2 plus 5. So you know that's a line with positive slope that crosses the axis at 5. Now, I don't know really where those points of intersection are because I am not that good at drawing. I certainly can't tell. So I need to figure out algebraically where the two cross. So I'm going to do this one by substitution. First thing I'll do is I find the thing that's easiest to substitute. And looks like here on my sheet, I substituted, I solved for Y. Just to be contrary, let's solve for X this time. Then we would have X is equal to 2Y minus 10. Then we would take this X and plug it into the other equation. So 2Y minus 10 squared plus y is equal to 10. The other way was simpler, but that's okay. We'll get the same answer. So 4y squared, outer times first times outer times inner times last, so that would be 20 minus 40y plus 100 plus y equals 10. So 4y squared minus 39y plus 90 equals 0. So yeah, it was a whole lot easier the other way, but that's all right because we have a polysolve button. Second. Clear out the old stuff, polysolve. So A is 4. Negative 39. And 90. So I get Y equals 15 over 4. and y equals 6. So now x is equal to 2 times 15 over 4 minus 10. So 15 over 2 minus, I'm going to go ahead and write it as 20 over 2 because I have to do fraction arithmetic. That gives me negative 5 halves. So one of my solutions is negative 5 halves and 15 over 4. The other one I just plug in 6. So x is equal to 2 times 6 minus 10, 12 minus 10. 
So two, six is my other solution. And how about that? We got the exact same answers. So easy enough substitution, just like when you had a linear system and you can see that my graph was really not good at all, but it gave me enough to know that I should expect two intersection points. Let me know when you have questions. So not always going to be a line and a parabola. This one we have a parabola and a cubic x cubed minus 2x minus y equals 0. Now, I really would not expect you to graph a cubic yourself on test day, but we could logic our way through this and get a pretty good idea of what's going on because this is just y equals negative x squared. So your generic parabola flipped upside down. This one we have y equals x cubed minus plus 2x because I just add y to each side. Then I would have x times x squared. That should be minus, minus, minus. Two. So I know that it crosses the axis three times at zero and at plus or minus square root of two. I also know that it starts low and ends high. So it's going to cross the axis and look something like that. It doesn't look perfect, but I have an idea that I should expect three intersection points for these two graphs. So this one, it looks easy to just let replace y with x squared. So I'll take this one. We have x cubed minus 2x minus negative x squared is equal to zero. So x cubed minus minus, so that would be plus x squared minus 2x is equal to zero. X squared plus x minus two. And yay, it's something that is easy to factor two numbers whose product is equal to negative two, whose sum is equal to one. So I get x equals zero, x equals negative two, and x equals one. So y is equal to negative x squared. So I get y equals zero y equals negative 2 squared negative whoops equals negative of negative 2 squared so negative 2 and negative 4 and y equals the negative of 1 squared so we have the point 1 negative 1 And there's the pretty answers. Questions so far? No, thank you. Okay. Now, if you have a really good memory from your 172 class, Maybe you look at that 2x squared minus y squared plus 8, and you know exactly what it's going to be. Maybe not. Again, on test day, I would not expect you to be able to sketch out a hyperbola just off the top of your head. 
So we'll just look at the graph here. And it's kind of like back in the optimization section where you would take the objective function and the constraint function and you would rewrite the constraint and plug it into the objective. It's the exact same thing. We're just substituting. So we have X times Y is equal to eight. We could solve for either X or Y, and it's not going to be hard either way. So Y is equal to 8 over X. So 2 times X squared minus 8 over X squared plus 8 is equal to 0. So 2X squared minus 64 over X squared plus 8 is equal to zero. So I'm going to multiply everything by x squared to get rid of this annoying fraction. So 2x to the fourth power minus 64 plus 8x squared is equal to zero. Now I really like descending order of exponents and every number here is even. So I'm going to do two things at once. I'm going to factor out two and write it in descending order of exponents. So now I'll factor. I need two numbers whose product is negative 32, whose sum is positive 4. So that looks like a minus 8 and a plus 4. 2 will never equal to 0. x squared minus 8 equals 0 when x squared is equal to 8. So x is plus or minus the square root of x x squared plus 4 equals 0, nowhere in the real world. So I get two values for x. If x is equal to the square root of 8, then y is equal to 8 over the square root of 8, which is the square root of 8. And make sure I have everything right. Three x squared minus that's a plus four. So I want the eight to be positive, and yeah. I factored wrong. You were probably sitting there thinking, Ms. Sleeper, you factored wrong. You've got your coffee sitting right there next to you. Why did you factor wrong? There we go. It's plus 8. It's minus 4 because that needed to be positive. So this is the one that has no real solutions. X is plus or minus 2. So now life is beautiful because if X is equal to 2, then Y is equal to 8 over 2. If X is negative 2, then Y is equal to 8 over negative 2. So we have 2, 4, and we have negative 2, negative 4. <laughs> So, you couldn't have x squared negative 8. Yeah, x squared equals negative 8 doesn't have any real solutions. Oh, oh. Yeah. I mean, yes, if you were being rigorous, you would write down x squared plus 8 equals 0. 
x squared equals negative eight, and then you'd realize, oh, no, we're only interested in real numbers, not imaginary numbers, and then you'd put the big X mark through it. There we go. So if we wanted to find where these intersect, I would definitely go for x equals the negative of the square root of y, because nothing else is easy to isolate. That's how you choose what to isolate. You go for whatever's easy. Then you have to use the other equation. So y squared minus 4x squared equals 12. So, I'm replacing x. I have y squared minus 4 times negative square root of y squared equals 12. So, y squared, I have minus minus. So, but this is squared, so that's minus negative square root of y squared just gives me y is equal to 12. And I don't lose the 4. y squared minus 4y plus minus 12, I have to subtract it from each side, is equal to 0. Two numbers whose product is negative 12, whose sum is equal to 4, is 6 and 2, and the big one needs to be negative. So, y is equal to negative 2, or y is equal to 6. Then I go back up to the tippy top to see what my x's are. If y is equal to negative 2, then x is equal to the negative square root of negative 2. And again, nowhere in the real world does that one exist. So x equals negative square root of 6. So here's my good answer, negative square root of 6 and 6. And you can see that it only has the one solution sitting there. So if this were a calculus problem, we'd be trying to find the area between those two curves. So you would know that the area between those two curves happens when x goes from negative square root of 6 to 0, because that's the only time there's area between those two curves. Or if you were looking at it in the y direction, the area between the two curves, the y goes from 0 up to 6. So feeling pretty good about substituting? Yes. Let's do some eliminating. Particularly when you have more complicated equations, eliminating can be a little simpler. I'm going to redo the first problem just to show that you can do them all either way. As the first one was super easy, either way. This one just jumps out at you and says, well, I've got a plain old y up top and I have minus 2y in the second equation. So sketch the graph. You add constant multiples of the equations together to eliminate one of the variables. You solve for the remaining variable. 
and then you back substitute into either one of the first equations. So we start with x squared plus y equals 10, x minus 2y equals negative 10. So I see that both equations have y's in them. So I'll multiply this equation times 2. 2x squared plus 2y equals 2 times 10. And then I'll just add these two things together and get a new equation that has no y's in it. So 2x squared plus x equals 20 minus 10 is 10. 2x squared plus x minus 10 equals 0. x and x. Now I need two numbers whose product is negative 10. And when I add them together, we need to have a plus 1 in the middle. So I'm thinking that 2 and 5 are going to be good choices because 5 minus 4 gives me the 1. So my 4 needs to be negative my 5 needs to be positive. So 2x is negative 5, x is negative 5 halves, or x is 2. And then just like we did a moment ago, actually we went backwards a moment ago, but you plug them in and you can plug into either equation that you want to. So I would probably use the linear equation because it would be easier. I always just choose whatever is easy. But you could use the quadratic one if you wanted to. Now we'll pretend that we don't know by looking at the picture what's going to happen here. Because chances are, if you were presented with this system of equations, you probably wouldn't sketch a graph of it because it looks kind of intimidating. It's got y squared and it's got a lot of squares in it. And I know that's an ellipse there and a parabola, but I don't know exactly what they look like. So let's pretend we don't know what the graph looks like. We start with x squared plus 2y squared is equal to 2. 2x squared minus 3y equals 11. So you have choices. You can get rid of your x's or you can get rid of your y's. It doesn't matter. Either one will work. So since I did the x's over there, we can get rid of the y's. I'll multiply this equation by 3. Gives me 3x squared plus 6y squared. And Oh, no, that's not a squared. We can't get rid of the y's. Never mind. We have to do the x's because that's a squared and that's a plain old y. So I will just multiply the top one by negative 2. Minus. 4y squared equals negative 4. And then I have 2x squared minus 3y equals 11. My x's disappear. I have minus 4y squared minus 3y equals negative 4 plus 11 gives me 7. I don't like having a negative as my leading term, so I'm going to rewrite it as 4y squared plus 3y plus 7 is equal to 0. I'll just bring everything over to that side. So plug it into the old calculator. 
you could do the quadratic formula and it's right there on the sheet, but let's just go ahead and do four. Clear out the old stuff, three. Clear out the old stuff, seven, solve. As soon as you see three, eight, negative three eights plus something, you know that you have imaginary numbers there because they are the complex conjugates. You have negative one, negative three eights plus 1.2, et cetera, and you have negative three eights minus 1.2, et cetera, times I. So this has no real solutions. They never ever cross. So that's what systems look like when they have no solutions. They never cross. I definitely would never expect you to be able to graph this without technology. You have X squared and Y cubed. It's not even a, a, an ellipse or a hyperbola or anything that you've ever had to graph before. So I look at this one. You have choices. We can get rid of the X's or we can get rid of the Y's. Looks like I got rid of the X's. So let's see what happens if I try to get rid of the Y's this time. 3X squared. And I can because both equations have Y cubed in them. And I have 6x squared plus 54y cubed equals 26. So I'll just multiply this one by 2. Then I have 6x squared plus 2 times 27 is 54y cubed equals 22. I have 6x squared Oh, that should have been a minus. Plus 54y cubed equals 26. Those go away. 12x squared is equal to 22 plus 26, 48. So x squared is equal to 48 divided by 12 x equals plus or minus square root of 4. So x is equal to plus or minus 2. Then I can go back to either one of the original equations to figure out what my y's are. So I'll go with the top one. 3x squared minus 27y cubed equals 11. If x is equal to 2, then I have 3 times 4 minus 27y cubed is equal to 11. So 12 minus 27y cubed is equal to 11. Negative 27y cubed is equal to 11 minus 12 is minus 1. So y cubed is equal to 1 over 27. So y is equal to 1 third. Now what's going to happen when I plug negative 2 in I'm going to end up squaring it and it's going to become a 4 and I'm going to go through the exact same process and end up with y equals one third again. So I have two answers. I have 2 and one third and I have negative 2 one third. So either way you do it, you get the same darned answer.
again, I would never expect you to graph this thing without technology. Because now we've got X to the fourth power and Y to the third power. But if you wanted the area between these two curves, you would need to know where they cross one another so you could set up the proper integrals. Now, this one we have x to the fourth minus y cubed equals 15, 3x to the fourth plus 5y cubed equals 53. You can do it however you want to. Generally, if I have one equation that has variables that have opposite signs, I just go ahead and go with that because then I could just multiply this one by five and I'm just going to do it here below. I'll have five X to the fourth minus five Y cubed equals five times 15 is, I believe it's 75, five, get out of here, five times 15 is indeed 75. So that goes away. I have eight X to the fourth is equal to 53 plus 75. not times plus, so x to the fourth equals 128 divided by eight. How convenient that happens to be a perfect fourth root. So x is equal to plus or minus the fourth root of 16, which is plus or minus so either one I would definitely go with this top one because it has less numbers in it and I'm less likely to mess it up so x equals 2 then I have 2 to the fourth minus y cubed is equal to 15 and 2 to the fourth is 16 minus y cubed equals 15, so minus y cubed is equal to 15 minus 16 is minus one. Y cubed equals one. Y equals one. Now when I plug X equals negative two in here, negative two to the fourth power is exactly the same as positive two to the fourth power, so my arithmetic would be exactly the same. And I end up with 2, 1, and a negative 2, 1. I think I have one more on here. Yep. Yep, one more. Okay, now this one, I don't even know how you would find the area between these two curves because they're just crazy, but we'll solve it anyway. <coughs> 4 over x squared plus 6 over y to the fourth equals 7 halves and 1 over x squared minus 2 over y to the fourth equals zero. So again, this one has a plus on the y term and this one has a minus. So I would probably just go ahead and multiply this one by three so that I could just add them together. 
So I'll rewrite 4 over x squared plus 6 over y squared equals 7 halves. And another advantage is I have a 0 sitting right here, and multiplying 0 by 3 is easy. 3 over x squared minus 6 over y to the fourth is still equal to 0. So now those go away. I'm left with 4 over x squared plus 3 over x squared equals 7 over 2, but I'm so happy that I happen to have a common denominator. So all I have to do is add the numerators. x squared and let's see, okay, equals 7 over 2. Now I'm going to cross multiply. So 2 times 7 is 14 equals 7x squared. So 2 is equal to x squared. So x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 2. Now you can go back to either one and again I would use 1 over x squared minus 2 over y to the fourth equals zero to figure out what your y is. And it's going to be nice again because we're squaring it and we'll get the same y values for the x values. So we have 1 over, we'll just do square root of 2 squared minus 2 over y to the fourth is equal to 0. Square root of 2 squared is a half minus 2 over y to the fourth is equal to 0. So 1 half is equal to 2 over y to the fourth power y to the fourth power is equal to cross multiply 4. So y is equal to the fourth root of 4, which is 2 squared to the 1 fourth power, which is 2 to the one half power square root of two. And since this was an even exponent, these get plus or minuses. So we end up with square root of two, square root of two, square root of two, negative square root of two. But when we plug negative square root of two in here, we're going to get the same y values. So negative 2 goes with square root of 2, and negative 2 goes with negative square root of 2. So that's where all 1, 2, 3, 4 of those solutions come from. So how are you feeling about solving systems of equations? Pretty good. Okay. Rest assured, the ones you're going to see will look more like that, more like a parabola and a line or two parabolas, maybe two sideways parabolas. You're not going to be trying to solve anything super complicated. Now, the other thing we were going to look at today is going to come in handy when we're doing U substitution. First thing you need to do is familiarize yourself with those inverse trig derivatives. So be sure you know those inside and out and outside and in so that you recognize when you see them and when you see a 
chain rule involving the inverse trig functions. So you want to be able to recognize, oh, I have one plus f of x squared in the bottom and I have f primed of x sitting on top. Well, that's the derivative of arctan of f of x. Same with inverse sine and inverse secant. If you know these three, then inverse cotangent, inverse cosine, and inverse cosecant just have negative signs plopped in front of them. So we concentrate on tangent, sine, and secant. So when you look at something like 4x cubed over 1 plus x to the 8th power, if you were just thinking about inside functions and outside functions, you would normally just look at that denominator and think, OK, well, this is my inside function because I could write this. I left my x out. I could write this as 1 plus x to the 8th power inside a big set of parentheses with a negative sign. But when you get to u substitution, you'll see that's not quite going to work for you because u substitution requires magic. And if you let u be equal to this, you will have no magic. But if we rewrite this, 4x cubed over 1 plus x to the fourth squared. Let me move this. Every even exponent can be written as a perfect square. You just divide it by two. Pull the two out, so now I have x to the fourth. So now if I let f of x be equal to x to the fourth power, f primed of x is equal to 4x cubed. So what I have here is f primed of x sitting on top of 1 plus f of x squared, which is the derivative with respect to x of the arctan of f of x. That's the kind of thing you need to be on the lookout for. So first thing to remember, every even exponent can be rewritten as a perfect square. Next one we have e to the x sitting on top of square root of 1 minus e to the 2x. That's an even exponent, so it can be written as a perfect square. E to the 2x is equal to e to the x whole darn thing squared. You just half that exponent and pull the 2 to the outside of the parentheses. So this is e to the x sitting on top of 1 minus e to the x squared. So there's my f of x. Here's f primed of x. So what I have here is the derivative with respect to x, inverse sine of e to the x. And just to have one with t's in it, because don't be confused when you have a different variable besides x. 
we have t sitting on top of t squared times square root t to the fourth minus one nice simple even exponent t to the fourth is t squared squared so if this is f of t now you notice i just have a t i need a two up there but that's okay because that's just a constant multiple and when we're doing derivatives or when we're doing integrals constant multiples can be adjusted for so i need a two up here so I'll put a one half out front and then I'll have 2t, which is f primed of t, sitting on top of f of t, because f of t is t squared, square root of f of t squared minus 1. So this is one half of the derivative of the arc secant of t squared. Those aren't always easy to see, so you have to get really used to looking for even exponents and things that look similar to inverse trig derivatives. And that's going to help you a lot when you get to u substitution. And that is all I have for you today. Any questions? Um, no, no, no questions. Material. Uh, I just have one no, 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 uh, project. Okay. So. If, if, to complete it say individually like i saw there was a section like for when they take your i guess like if a partner if you had one took your you know uh questions that you prepared mm -hmm. um like if you did it individually like like would that not be necessary then if you are going to write a test you're going to need to have a partner to take the test for you okay Okay. So find yourself a partner. Work with somebody. Okay. Yeah. 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 I would, okay. I was just curious. Yeah. So. Okay. Great. And that way, you you know, you can write half of it. They can write half of it. You take half. They take half, and you grade each other's answers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. All right. Well, have a good weekend, Professor. You too.